welcome and thank you for joining us on the online worship service of East Cobb Presbyterian Church. My name is Tim Locke. I minister here at the church, and it's a joy to be with you as we worship the Lord. Now, worshiping at home is challenging. My encouragement to all of our congregation this week in a video that I put out is that you might consider uh, having a worship party and having maybe another family or two join you at home to worship. Uh, maybe physical distance and wear a mask, but still join together. We are really being challenged through this pandemic uh, to maintain and extend gospel community because this is, community is, is challenging right now. But I'm so thankful that you've joined us for worship. Make sure to go to eastcobprez.org forward slash live. There you can download the worship bulletin, the uh, children's bulletin, and there will be some study questions there that we'd love for you to take through your family through or go through in your own personal worship. And just you know, consider what God is teaching us through the Gospel of John. On the bottom of that same page is a form, and it lets us know that you're worshiping with us, and it lets us know who's worshiping with you. In addition, there's a place there where you can put comments and we would welcome any prayer requests that you might have or let us know about the needs that you might have as uh, we move forward in these challenging times. Now, would you hear with me or listen with me as we read our call to worship, which is taken from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Here's what the Apostle John says uh, that he saw in heaven. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Join me as we worship the one who is truly worthy to receive our praise. The love of Christ is rich and free, fixed on his own eternally. No earth, no hell can it remove, long as he lives his own in love. His love.
the love of Christ is rich and free indeed. If we love Jesus, wherever we live here on earth, our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to him, and with him there is no more pain, no more sin, no more persecution, no more waiting. If we, those citizens of heaven, still live here on earth, it must be because we need to spark or encourage someone's joy in Jesus. Things are different. Most of us won't greet our co-workers at the coffee maker tomorrow morning. Talk about our weekends. I can go days without seeing someone in real life. So this changes our opportunities to spark and encourage the joy of Jesus in our neighbors' lives. So we should stay in scripture. We should stay in prayer. We should stay in praise and anticipate new opportunities. Let's sing about that and how great is your love. From the darkness I called your name Into the darkness your mercy came You called me
as we continue in our worship, we want to take time to review the gospel together, to remember what God has done for us, and to remember that we, we look to the Lord to finish the work that he has begun in us. As Paul says in Philippians 1, that he is confident that the person, God, who began the good work in us will bring it to completion. And so join me as we rehearse our confession of our faith in the gospel that we have received. It's taken from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. Paul asks this, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. This is the great conflict that we face as we live our daily lives. Do we abide in Christ and submit ourselves to him, or do we uh, submit ourselves to our flesh? And so Paul is urging us as believers not to live in our flesh, not to live in the desires of our sin nature, but to submit ourselves to God so that he's, his continuing work of transformation can occur in our lives. Now, that's going to happen whether we surrender or not. But we're called to be submissive to the Lord and to experience his grace. And here's how Paul responds to that in assurance. Because while we surrender ourselves to the Lord and we seek the Lord and we make, take advantage of the means of grace, it is the work of God to transform us. Paul says this in the next two verses, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient, and notice these words, from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. This is the work of God on our behalf to transform our hearts, to make us actually desire righteousness for which we were born again. So we praise the Lord for his work of grace, remembering what he's done for us. It's my pleasure today to uh, encourage you to find ways to bridge the gap between pandemic and community life. And I want to continue, I did in my video this week, and I want to continue to encourage you to bridge that gap, to find ways, whether it's in your life group or your journey group, or maybe it's just people you're connecting to on Zoom or in worship, to find ways to connect and experience gospel-centered community. It's challenging when we're worshiping online or worshiping in a very sterile environment here in the gym to engage with each other. But, you know, small groups are great opportunities to do that. So consider having a worship party. Those of you who who come to worship on Sunday or who plan on it, maybe consider uh, joining someone here on campus, sitting with them, and then going out to lunch together or having lunch in your home together. These are ways that small groups of people, still with the protocols in place, can work to experience community. I would ask you to pray for our Embrace Life ministry, which kicks off this week, and uh, would would, uh, ask you to get involved as you're able. Uh, In addition, we put out a video with Pastor Paul updating the church on everything kind of that he's been doing over the last year, especially in his ministry at Grace Point. And I would urge you to go on to YouTube, our YouTube channel, and watch that. It's a lot of fun, but it really is a joy to hear what God has used this church to do to support our sister church through loaning Pastor Paul to them for about 10 months. And then especially this week, folks, I would ask you to pray for our school. ECCS begins school this coming week. And we are at, our teachers have been busy. Our church and school staff had a great meal uh, this week and just got to know each other more and encouraged each other in the Lord. And we are praying for our teachers. We are praying for our administrators. And we are praying for our students that God would keep us healthy and that God would continue to extend gospel community to our students and the discipleship ministry of our church and school would go forward with the grace of God. So please be in prayer for them. Church, thanks for all that you're doing to help keep East Cobb Presbyterian Church and its ministries financially strong. 
please go to eastcobprez.org forward slash give and support the church to the best of your ability. And let's uh, see what God can do and continue to do through our church ministry as we labor together to reach East Cobb with the gospel. Let me pray for us. Father, it's a joy to be a part of your church, to see how your spirit is stirring up your people to do your work. And we pray for all the things that we are formally engaged in, Embrace Life, the school, the youth ministry, children's ministry, everything that we are engaged in formally, but so much, Lord, that's happening informally as your people step out as ambassadors for Christ in our community. Father, give us grace to love the people around us who are angry, who are fearful, who are uh, uncertain about the future. Give us grace to show them and give them the confidence that we have in Christ. Lord, send your Spirit ahead of us to do works in the hearts of, uh, of people, and let us be a blessing to them. Lord, use our relief fund. Help our church people to come in contact with people who need the extra help that our relief fund can offer. And Lord, use this to bless our community for the glory of Christ. Thank you so much, Father, for what you're doing at ECPC and at ECCS. Grant us your grace, Lord. Bless the work of our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. falls the even tide darkest deepens Lord with me Shadows rise and light. 
morning. I'm Shankar Narayan, one of your elders here at East Cobb, and it's my privilege this morning to lead us in prayer. But before we have the prayer, I want to read a few words from Psalm 63 as a prelude. It's a prayer that talks about a soul thirsting for being satisfied in God. And I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. The psalmist says, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. It's a very comforting words, seeking assurance from God. Let's be reminded of that as we go to prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we are gathered here this morning in worship, once again separated from one another physically, but together in spirit, we're so thankful that you love us, watch over us, protect us, and prepare for us an eternal future in Christ. We have many things to be thankful for here, for our country, our freedoms, our church here at East Cobb, and our families. We also realize that these are very troubling times. And Father, as our nation struggles from all these problems that seem to hold us back from moving forward, I pray that you would guide the hands of the people who are in positions of power, positions of leadership, and at all levels of government, local and national. We pray for wise governance and good decision-making. Father, while we're thankful that we can worship you freely here, there are many in the world who do not, who do not and are not able to and suffer from persecution in your name. We pray that you would protect them and reassure them that you're very much in control. Father, we pray for our family here at East Cobb. We have many requests, spoken and unspoken, and we bring them all to you. We pray, first of all, for the health of our members, that you would keep them safe from this virus, and should they fall ill, that they would recover soon and recover fully. We pray especially for the elderly among us who are more susceptible. We pray for your gentle presence with Quincy Acklin as he mourns the loss of his father. We pray that you'd comfort him. We're thankful, Father, that the financial needs of our church are being met adequately during this difficult time. And we pray that you would continue to help us to be, to be generous in our support of all that our church serves. We pray for our marriages, for all our missionaries, those who are currently serving overseas, as well as those who are constrained by the virus to stay here in the U.S. and continue their work. Our school and its leadership, we realize that the school is opening on Monday and we pray for a safe opening. We pray for the children's and youth programs and all those who labor tirelessly to make it work. Father, we pray for also for the work of Summerhill Ministries as well as that of MUST. And finally, Father, we pray for our leadership here at East Cobb, our pastors, the elders, the deacons, Teach us, Lord, to be examples. Teach us to be servants. Teach us to be servant leaders. Father, there are numerous other requests that we have that are in the minds of those who are present here. I pray that you would comfort each of us who has a need as only you can. And Father, as we continue with our worship this morning, be with our pastor Tim as he brings the message and help us to be attentive to your word. Amen. Would you join me in your Bibles to John chapter 4? John chapter 4. We're in a great passage of Scripture. Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Our children can join us in their following Jesus Bible on page 1143 and 44. Remember, John is writing so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you will have eternal life. In addition to that, he wants you as a believer to read it and to grow in your faith and your understanding of who Jesus is. He wants us to contemplate what he's saying, particularly to a Jewish audience who is going to read this very critically with their Jewish culture and understanding in mind. And, and John is, is addressing those Jewish issues. So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 4. It's a long passage. Let me read it quickly. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, 
He left Judea and departed for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, uh, be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, it's a great passage. It's a great conversation. Remember, John is writing this. He's leveraging these conversations. So let's learn a little bit about the backstory before we jump in. Number one, Samaria, an area of the Jewish kingdom, was conquered by the Assyrian Empire in 722-721 BC. They took the people from Samaria, middle, educated, upper-class people, and they shipped them out and brought in their own middle, lower-class, and poor people to live amongst the people of Samaria. Intermarriage happened, which was forbidden. The people of God, the Israelites, were not allowed to intermarry with Gentiles, but they did. And so this was a strike against them with the purer people in the land. And remember, they're trying to remain pure for righteousness' sake and also because they're producing a godly seed and someday Messiah. And so intermarriage was strictly forbidden for the Jewish people alone, (laughs) not for us. But that was a strike against them. In addition, uh, they set up an altar on Mount Gerizim. Now, Altars had been set up there before, but God moved his presence to Jerusalem, and they should have known that, but they chose to worship at Mount Gerizim. This made them a cult in the Jewish mind. So conservative Jews viewed the Sumerians as a cult, as a religious cult. In addition to that, they only read the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So you don't have, they didn't have the book of Kings and Samuel where David becomes king and God moves his presence through David and Solomon to Jerusalem and builds a temple there. So they don't have that. They don't have the prophets, the minor prophets. They don't have any of those scriptures because they don't view them as being from God. And so they are a serious cult in the Jewish mind. And so there's real tension between Jews and Samarians. Uh, Many times, Orthodox, conservative Jews would go around this part of the country. Jesus, obviously not concerned about it, rips right through it, stops at a well, and talks to this Samaritan woman. Has no thought for the racial tension that she expected. He didn't have it. 
Because this isn't Jesus. The gospel and the kingdom of God is not about race. It is about the grace of God coming to sinners. So Jesus ignores the racial tension between the woman of Samaria and offers her the grace that he provides. So that's what's happening in the text from a kind of a backstory. And John is leveraging this. John, the author, is leveraging this conversation so that you will believe, receiving what God offers to you in Jesus. And it comes out in some of the questions. Remember, you've got to put yourself in the position of a Jewish person reading this gospel. A lot of the nuance of the text falls flat on us because we're not Jewish, and we didn't grow up in a Jewish home, and we didn't grow up in the culture of the day. But as a Jewish person would read this and contemplate it, certain things would stand out. Number one, are you greater than Jacob? What an astounding question. Jacob was a massive figure in Jewish history. And so for the woman to ask that, the answer to it is yes. And at the end, he claims that he's the Messiah. So clearly he's greater than Jacob. But you see what she's living on, what what she's built her identity around. So are you greater than Jacob? This is a question that as a reader, John the author wants you to ask. Is Jesus greater than my ancestors? How will you get water? Man, that's a piercing question, as you will see as we go through the text. We are all working for water. Water sustains life. How will you get it? And and she asks that to Jesus because Jesus is, is saying, I have water that you don't know of. If you knew who I was, I'd have gifted you something that would have satisfied you. And she says, sir, the well is deep. How will you get it? And this is a piercing question John the author wants you to ask. What are you drinking and how are you getting it? And then he speaks of water in the text. Typically in the text, water has referred to the cleansing rite of baptism so far in the Gospel of John. But now it's referring to something else. And we'll see what it means. It's the goodness of God. And then this startling statement that you as a reader and I as a reader have to respond to. Jesus says, I am the Messiah. He flat out claims it to this sweet Samaritan woman. He hasn't claimed it to the Jewish leaders yet. But here he tells her that he is the Christ. So these are things that stand out in the text that John is leveraging to get you as a reader to engage with. And so I think the point is to come and see a new life with God that transcends religion. Now, let's go through the text. Number one, Jesus offers us more than religion. Again, let me rehearse these things. Number one, water that must be drawn. This, I believe, has a figurative uh, nature to it in the discussion between Jesus and the woman at the well. She asks him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Her perspective is on what she's doing to sustain life. Jesus, though, contrasts that with the water that he can give her that will make her not thirst anymore. He wants her to look at her water drinking and the drawing of water from a different perspective. And so Jesus takes her pursuit of life-giving water and he uses that in contrast to something he wants her to see. And so that becomes... Uh, an element of our craving and of our, our, our chasing after what would satisfy. And you'll see that in just a second as we go through the text. And so Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, and because he says that, he's drawing a comparison with her work's effort, with her effort to provide for herself what would satisfy. Secondly, you see that he addresses the heritage and her ancestry. What she's building her identity around is that Jacob gave Joseph this piece of land and this well. In fact, this very well Jacob dug and his sons drank from it and his livestock. I mean, this is my heritage. This is my ancestry. And so for her to ask, are you greater than Jacob? It tells you what she's based her identity on. And then the final thing is Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem. Now, Mount Gerizim is where the blessings of the covenant were pronounced. And so she, you know, she is arguing that, the Samaritans argued that Mount Gerizim is where they should be worshiping God. But remember, they didn't have the rest of the Bible where they could see how God moved the location of his presence to Jerusalem. 
And so Jesus is right in that the law moves the place of worship to Jerusalem, but it tells you what's on her mind. She wants an answer to this because she feels very righteous in her religion and in her practice that she's following the law, that she's following the book. And Jesus is going to contrast that. So what John is bringing out is her religion, the traditions of men that she has followed. He's bringing out her works that she's doing to try and satisfy her and how Jesus wants to do something for her and give her something. He's bringing out her ancestry and what she's built her identity on. And these are not subtle things, folks. These are just kind of laying right there on the ground. If you put yourself in a Jewish mindset, they kind of pop off the page. So Jesus offers us more than religion. That's a major thought in the text because he's dealing with a highly religious person, just like Nicodemus. He's dealing with a highly religious person, but someone who in the Jewish mind was in a cult. Secondly, Jesus provides the outpouring of God's grace. And I'm using the word grace in, the, in terms of God's goodness. When Paul goes to define the grace of God in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and following, he says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God... And that's almost exactly what he says in chapter 2 when he says the grace of God has appeared. What is the grace of God? It is his goodness, it is his loving kindness, his mercy, it is his faithfulness to us. Jesus wants to tell her that he can provide something, the outpouring of God's goodness. And it's in this idea of living water. It's not water that's alive, that's a stream versus a pond. Uh, My son and I went fishing in a very stagnant pond this last week. Uh, Vegetation was growing underneath. There was all this algae. The fish were hiding or they they had been raptured. I don't know. Maybe everyone caught them. I don't know. But it was nasty. When we stepped our foot in, our foot sunk. The difference between that and a stream is you have running water and typically the ground is more solid and you don't have a bunch of stuff growing. And so she takes it that he means not stagnant water but a, a spring and What's interesting is the well that Jacob dug actually is fed by an underground stream, an underground dynamic living uh, water. And so Jesus is being very skillful here in what he says to her. I want to provide living water. But he uses a word that doesn't just mean moving water. It is literally water that is alive, that is life-giving, that is living he says, I have this for you, and it's, it, it, it is a real contrast with the Old Testament. Remember Jeremiah chapter 2? This is what God says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. That's the first evil. The second one, uh, 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 they have forsaken me, and he defines himself, the fountain of the waters of life, the source of life for mankind. They have forsaken me. And the second thing is they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, this can mean either the clay pots that they had hewn out, but it probably means the large cisterns that they would carve out of the rock, the uh, volcanic rock of the mountains and of the, uh, the different places where they would live, and then they would build trenches so that when the rain came, all the water would be diverted to these cisterns, and that's how they had water for years, even though it didn't rain more than once or twice a year. They had these huge cisterns, as big as some of our, our uh, f- baseball fields here in Atlanta, a cistern that, that could fit thousands and thousands of gallons of water. And so that's probably what, G, what God is referring to is these large cisterns that they think this will satisfy us, this will provide for us, this is all we need. And God is, you know, he's over there scratching his head. You need that? No, you need me. You need me. And Jesus is going to contrast not only water from God, but also food. And just in the next paragraph, Jesus is going to say, I have food that you don't know of. My food is to do the will of God, the will of my Father. But in this, in this section, it's water. And he's contrasting this idea of leaving the fountain of living water, God, for our religion, 
for the things that we think will satisfy us. And that's what this woman was doing. She was clinging to a cult. She was clinging to something that wasn't true and wasn't going to satisfy her and wasn't going to give her life. And so Jesus is addressing that. Uh, This is how the prophets, which she didn't have these passages, this is how the prophets speak about what God will do when he brings renewal. Living waters shall flow. What's he talking about? He's talking about the life that's going to come when God brings renewal. It's like a stream flowing. Ezekiel 47, water for them flows where from? From the sanctuary. Think of the book of Revelation. I didn't even put that one in there. Think of the book of Revelation. What's coming out of the throne? A river of life. This is the imagery that Jesus is picking up on and that John is leveraging to get you as a reader to ask the question, what are you drinking? What are you looking to to sustain your life? Because water is new life in this text. Water is what sustains life in these texts that I've read. Water is what grows life. And all of this is packed in this idea of water that is alive. It is new life. It is what sustains a person. And it is what grows fruit, a harvest in the life. That's what Jesus is offering this woman. Water is the grace of God to sinners, granting them life and satisfying their soul in the harsh conditions of a broken world. And let me tell you, every Jewish reader, they knew exactly how the Old Testament spoke about God as the fountain of life and what he would do to bring renewal. And Jesus is bringing that up to this woman. She doesn't get it because she only has the five, first five books of the Bible. She doesn't have the rest. But John's readers got it John's readers, his, his Jewish readers, are cluing in to what Jesus is doing and to what Jesus is saying about himself, God, and what he offers. Thirdly, Jesus establishes us with God. Now, I, I really wrestled with what word to use here because the idea is worship. The idea that the woman asks him and that Jesus is dialog- dialoguing with her on is worship. She, you know, Jesus confronts her. You've had five husbands. The guy you're living with right now isn't even your husband. She totally skirts the the issue that he brings up and just says, well, tell me where the right place to worship is. What is fascinating is how Jesus responds. He says, true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. He says it twice. He says it three times. He brings up spirit and truth. Two or three times here. Spirit addresses the issue of location, specifically in and here's the challenge with these things. We, we can make spirit and truth kind of mean whatever we want. And I've read several authors and books on worship who kind of want to make it whatever they want. If we're going to be faithful to the scriptures, we have to make it what the text says it is, what it means in the text. Spirit is a direct answer to the idea of location. Where do we go to worship God? Jesus' answer is right where you are. Because God is spirit. He doesn't have a body. He doesn't have an actual location. He put his presence in Jerusalem for a time. But that's about to be done away with. That's about to be destroyed. When he is crucified, folks, the the veil is torn in two. We are given access to God through Jesus Christ in a way that the Old Testament people didn't have. And Jesus is drawing attention to the fact that new covenant people, his hour, when his hour has come, that upon his death, burial, and resurrection... A new day is dawning, and there is no location where we pray toward like Daniel did, and no location where we travel to like uh, the Israelites used to do for the ceremonies where God has put himself. So God is spirit, and we worship God in spirit. We worship God not in a location. So it's very specific to her question. Jesus' answer is very specific to her question. Uh, Jesus' hour will liberate, his death, burial, and resurrection, will liberate believers from worshiping at a location. Secondly, truth. Truth addresses the issue of revelation and knowledge, the very thing she didn't have because she only had the first five books of the Bible. Jesus' hour will bring all believers into a knowledge of God. And and when, when he says, I am the Messiah, He's giving her the revelation she needed. And so when Jesus says, uh, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, because God is spirit, 
Uh, he then says to her, we worship what we know, you worship what you don't know. Because salvation is from the Jews. What he's telling her is we are in the stream of revelation from God. We have the, the full Old Testament. And we know that God is bringing salvation through a Jewish Messiah, and we know, and which she would testify to because she understood the Christ, the Messiah, is coming, a descendant of Jacob, a descendant of these ancestors. But, um, but she didn't have the rest of it, and Jesus is now giving her the knowledge that she needs. So the, Jesus' hour will bring all believers into a full knowledge of what God has hidden in the Old Testament, what God has hinted at in the Old Testament, and is now being really, uh, revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is what she says, I know that Messiah is coming. And Jesus hits her with this, I who speak to you am he. For the, uh, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So where do we worship? Jesus says uh, it's, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Um, and so Jesus brings her into this idea that we worship God in spirit and in truth, not in location, certainly not without the knowledge of who Messiah is. So all that God has revealed to us is critical as we worship him and as we worship him wherever we are because he is with us through his spirit. And then he hits her with this statement, the Father is seeking this kind of people, such people to worship him. And the point is not, woman, get yourself into spirit and truth. No, the point is that God is not waiting to make us ourselves this kind of, for us to make ourselves this kind of person. Rather, this is the kind of worshiper he is seeking to make in us. Folks, this is the grace that God has, that Christ has for this woman. This woman that is despised. He, he turns to her and says, the Father is seeking this kind of worshiper, someone who will worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what he's after. This is what he's offering. This is what he's doing. It's not that he's roaming the earth trying to find someone who's righteous, someone who's worshiping him the right way. No. It's that the new water, the, the water that is alive, the, the work of grace in our lives actually makes us the kind of worshipers that God is seeking. Who worship according to his word, according to what is revealed about himself, and worship him all the time in every place. So, some applications. Number one, what are you drinking? What are you drinking? Now, I, I've kind of asked it in a funny way intentionally. We're all drinking something. Some of you are drinking White Claw. Some of you are drinking Coke. Some of you are drinking, you know, water. We're all drinking something, and we need, Jesus would, and, and John the author would ask us to, to consider what are we looking to to satisfy us? What are we looking to to make us right with God, to give us a, a, a relationship with God? Is it where we worship? Is it our ancestors? Is it what we're doing to draw water. What are you drinking? Everyone drinks something, metaphorically, spiritually speaking. Does it satisfy your soul? That's the next question. Think about what you're drinking. Does it satisfy your soul? Maybe it's a cause. Maybe you're a part of a cause and you're fighting for justice in an area of this world that needs justice. And you go on a rally and you, you stand up against it. Does that satisfy? It, it, it's encouraging. It's exciting. It's fun to be a part of. But does it give you rest for your soul? Is it a spring bubbling up within you? Is it the goodness and the grace of God? Or do you find that the more you pursue justice for what, just, what pursuing justice will do for you, that you actually get more embittered, that you actually get more tribal and more angry at your opponents? This is not the grace and goodness of God. This is not a soul that is at rest in the grace of God that is pursuing justice from a position of humility and mercy. If Jesus were to confront you, if Jesus were to do for you what uh, he did for this woman and expose deep, dark secrets, things that are big issues of shame, what would he expose? I'm not asking you to write me or tell me, okay? And I'm not going to tell you mine. 
But I sat there reading this story and thinking about what Jesus just did to this woman as he appeals to her conscience, as he tries to knock her off her self-righteous pedestals of her ancestry and what she was doing and, and uh, where she was worshiping and her rightness as he's kind of undermining that self-righteousness. I wondered, I asked the question, if Jesus would hear, what would he say to me? What would he expose in me? What would he... What would he bring up to kind of undermine my self-righteousness? What would he do for you? What would that be like? And then I wondered, would he offer you the same forgiveness that he offered her? And you know the answer to that. Of course he would. That's what he came to do. Jesus is not condemning the woman in in this moment. He is not bringing up her failures in order to chastise her, but to undermine her self-righteousness so that she will turn to him for the living water that she needs. And so maybe he'll do that for you right now. What would he reveal in your life? Would he offer the same forgiveness? And I I promise you he does and he would. Has a tradition eclipsed God's presence in your life? Folks, this is just how the human heart is made. We come to faith We're excited about what we're learning about Jesus, and it doesn't take long, and whether or not we have candles in worship becomes a tradition that we cling to, and somehow life isn't right and God isn't good because there weren't candles in worship, or because we didn't sing a hymn in worship, or my favorite hymn. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that just creeps into church. We've never done it that way, and I don't like the way we're doing it now. Has tradition eclipsed God's presence in your life? I can't worship God with that. (laughs) Folks, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus says. I have been in rock concerts and have found my heart drawn to God for the amazing skill that he has given these musicians. I have found myself in baseball games and my heart is drawn to the fact that I'm sitting there with my family and I worship the Lord for his great gifts that I'm sitting here enjoying this. I found myself in ponds fishing, rejoicing at the beautiful day and just thanking God. Folks, worship can happen anywhere. You don't need the props because worship is a heart issue. It's a spirit issue. So I wonder if tradition has eclipsed God's presence in your own worship. And then just to remind you that Jesus is the source of grace from God. All the goodness of God, all the blessings of Mount Gerizim promised to those who obey. All of those are Jesus's. I deserve all the curses of Mount Ebal. Jesus took those curses for me, for my disobedience, and offers me all the blessings that he has rightfully earned. And my friends, that's what Jesus is offering us. And if you'd like to uh, explore that, I'd love to speak to you about it and let you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, bless your children. Bless us as we come and see the living water that Jesus offers us, a relationship that transcends religion. We ask for your grace to open our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we conclude our worship service, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure to worship with you online, to know that on campus and online, our hearts are united around the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are together worshiping our Lord and Savior. We'd love to have you on campus. We understand that that's not workable for some, but uh, be in prayer about how we can move forward together. And consider in the weeks to come, we will have another opportunity for communion shortly. Uh, We want to give you as many opportunities to join us in the table as we can. And uh, watch for those announcements. Make sure before you leave to go to eastcobpres.org forward slash live. Scroll down to the bottom page and let us know that you're worshiping with us and who's worshiping with you. And send us whatever needs you might have and we'll do what we can to reach out. I want to remind you, we do have a COVID relief fund, and if you need that help, please contact us. We want to hand this money out and use it to bless people. If you find people who need that kind of help, that financial help, people who have lost wages or lost their job, we want to be a blessing to them whether they're part of our church or not. So please help us get connected to them. Send us their email, myself or any one of our deacons, and we'll make sure we get in touch with them and see what we can do to help. Now hear these words of benediction taken from Numbers chapter, five, uh, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day.